Great. Um, I just want to thank you again for joining me. It's been a year since we did our last video series, and I think that we had such an interest in VO2 max, anaerobic threshold, as well as training the different gears. And we're, we're at a place now, I'm at a place now, where we can evolve the, evolve the understanding of what ESD is and what these components of training and all the variables. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about where I'm going, as I just had my new leaf test done, which is different than what I did before at the university. And I, can you discuss with us the importance of what this test tells us, why we should do it, how significant is it is in our training program, and how often we should retest it? Yeah, great starting place, great place to launch. So there's, there's four parts to that question, right? What, why do we need it? What does it do for us? That's the first part. Quite simply, it's clearer to me today than at any time in my career. And I have to admit that I've undulated in and out of my love affair and hate affair with ESD. That it's clearer than ever that this is not a nice thing to have. It's a necessary thing to have. We have to do this. Why? Because all movement has a metabolic demand. Whether you are in the pool on the track, playing rugby, in the gym, lifting weights, doing Pilates. If there is movement, there's a metabolic demand placed on the body. If we don't know what that metabolic demand is, we really are guessing. And as a result, we, there's a few things we fundamentally don't know about the person we're training. A, how much metabolic stress are we putting in the body? How much gas have they got in the tank? And when are they going to run out? So to me, it's absolutely fundamental that wherever possible, we have a baseline of metabolic measures. That's part one. Um, number two, I think part two was, what does it tell us? Was that part two, House? Yeah. Um, how, how significant is it in training our gears? Fundamental. The human engine, what we call the metabolic engine, has five gears. Okay? Has five gears. Two truths about that. We all have them, and at some point, the game of sport or the game of life is going to demand that we use them. Uh, so therefore, we must train them and condition them to some degree. The assessment piece tells you what are your five gears unique to your human metabolic engine. So again, if we don't know that, we've got no idea what gear we're training in. So in terms of significance, I think it's exceptionally significant. Yeah, absolutely. And then the third part to that question was... How often should we retest it? Great. The whole point of a test is to give you a baseline. And then second to that, if you're doing it in a reliable and reproducible way, and that's a key point that we're actually going to flush out in a minute, are you regressing or progressing towards your goal? So if you use a test, you would like to use the same test over and over again, and ideally every six to eight weeks, a max every 12 weeks, because... If someone's paying you hard-earned cash to, to help them create results in their own body, because that's what they're doing, you can't create results for them, you can create an opportunity for change, you've got to be accountable for that. So for me, reassessment is as important as the assessment, and if you don't do reassessment, there was no point doing the assessment. So every six to eight weeks, ideally, but eight to 12 if you can't. Great. So last year during the Pumpkin Man Triathlon that I did, my, my time was one hour and 48 minutes. And, and I took fifth place in my age group, and I'm hoping that I can do better this year. So now that I know my new VO2 max, as well as my anaerobic threshold from this test, what should I be targeting in my training, and which is more important? Yeah, fantastic. So for those viewers that saw our last video series a year ago, I, I can't believe it's been a year. I mean, that's gone, like, really quickly. Um, but since then, I mean, back then we did those videos. So I'm not going to explain in great detail what all the metabolic measures mean or what all the gears mean because they can go back and view that. What I'm going to do is I have your stats here. A year ago, your max heart rate was 184. Your VO2 was 59. Yep. Your VO2 at 80, an aerobic threshold, was 35. What does that mean right there? Okay, you've got a max heart rate, so when you're, when you're pumping as hard as possible, this is how many beats per minute. Your VO2 is the size of your engine. How big is your metabolic engine? 59, big. I mean, that's World Cup soccer. You know, that's, that's elite level size engine. Very impressive. But your AT was your limiting factor. Why? 
Because at 35 mils per kilogram per minute, you're at 60%. What does that mean? If your engine is this big and your AT is at 60%, once you tip past that anaerobic threshold, you go into uh, economic inefficiency with fuel. You know, you're going to run out of gas quicker. So the goal is, how far can we shift that anaerobic threshold to the right so that you can use more of your engine while still being economically efficient? Make sense? Yeah. In 211, your max heart rate, 197. Wow, that's a 13-beat difference. Could be conditioning, could be something else. Your VO2 was 50.1. So according to Newly, if it's gone down... But your anaerobic threshold was 49 mils per kilogram per minute. So it, your anaerobic threshold is hugely shifted to the right, but your VO2 apparently has dropped. So what does that mean? Two things. First of all, your anaerobic threshold is now pushed up against the max of your engine. You're at like 96%. So did we achieve our goal of shifting your threshold to the right? Absolutely. The big thing now is, where's it going to go? Because there's a wall. But before we talk about that, the other thing we've got to flag up here is the unreliability be intra-test, between tests. A year ago, you used a university lab, and now you've used New Leaf in a commercial club environment. And by the way, I love New Leaf. I think it's not only a great uh, uh, system they use, but the data is incredibly quick to download and very impacts on your training immediately so I love it but there's going to be a difference between a new leaf and an academic lab so we don't know which one of these stats are absolutely right do we You're right so from this point on every 8 to 12 weeks we want to do a new leaf test and a new leaf test and then we can correlate data more reliably and reproducibly what I can tell you at this point is you've got a higher max heart rate apparently a lower VO2, but your threshold has gone way, way to the right. So to me, what that tells me is our training worked, but I can't shift that threshold to the right anymore because you're going to max out. So now we have to look at actually increasing the size of your engine once more. Well, how about, you know, it's interesting that you note that there's this, this tipping point where the anaerobic threshold and the the VO2 max kind of meet, they're coming together. You know, when someone knows their anaerobic threshold, what is the best way to increase that? And knowing that once we increase our anaerobic threshold, like I did, we are pushing closer to the end of our engine. Mm. And we're decreasing our deficit ratio. So how do we train to increase our VO2 max once more, allowing us to increase our distance from our anaerobic threshold to our tipping point? Oh, I love that. I love that. So what, what I want our viewers to visualize right now is a window. A window between, if this is base and this is VO2 max, your threshold is here. It's a very small window. The wonderful thing to that is you can get right close to max engine capacity before you start running out of gas, you know, before you tip. The bad side is once you tip, you're going to be over. There's really nowhere to go. So we need to have a bigger window. And to do that, we're going to go back to the drawing board and say, I want to maintain that threshold, but increase the size of the engine. And so this brings up a really, for me, a fascinating discussion in exercise physiology. There's two proponents. There's what we call the utilization theory group, and there's what we call the presentation theory group. Right? This group over here, proponents of utilization, say the limiting factor to cardiorespiratory efficiency the limiting factor is the ability of the body to utilize oxygen. Kind of makes sense, right? I mean, if you can't use the oxygen, we crash and burn. Right. If you believe that, if that's the camp of thought that you, you put your hat in, then you're going to agree that the factors that limit that are things like oxidative enzymes, mitochondria, type 1 slow twitch fibers, all the things that allow us to extract more oxygen. Makes sense. However, Kind of opposing that is presentation theory, and what presentation theory tells us is, listen, the limiting factor isn't about how much oxygen you can use, even though that's a factor. It's how much can I get to the working muscles. It's a delivery issue, not an extraction issue. Now, when we're talking about how we deliver oxygen-rich blood to the muscle, we're looking at cardiac output, heart rate, stroke volume, blood pressure, you know, a pump. 
So they said, well, the limiting factor is delivery of oxygen. And so those things are going to dictate whether I get better or not. What does this mean for training? If you're in a utilization camp, you're talking about low intensity, high volume. If you're in the presentation camp, you're talking about high intensity, short volume work. You see what I mean? So it's, when we look at exercise physiology, these theories are very complex, but it completely impacts on training. You've been doing a lot of threshold training. That's why you've got a small window. So if we want to increase the size of your engine, do we do more volume but lower intensity? Or do we actually do higher volume? So it's a really tricky thing. So let's quickly flush out what both of those might look like so that then we can pick which one is going to be most appropriate for you. Cool? Cool. All right, great. So we know that there's, there's a few main methodologies or, or, or training styles to improving the size of our engine. Okay? One is the continuous running, whether it be short or long. One is intervals. One is tempo, okay? Uh, we've got heel runs, speed work, etc. If you are looking at utilization theory, you're working to the left side of anaerobic thresholds. So you're working gears two and three. So that means fairly low to moderate intensity, higher volume of work. Why? Because I'm going to increase mitochondria, oxidative enzymes, and the engine gets bigger. Great, because then if my threshold stays where it is, I'll create a bigger window. So that's one way we can go. The minute I go over a threshold, I don't have a lot, of in, a lot of gas left. So if you want to improve VO2 max through intensity, it's very simple. You're not working at threshold, you're working at max. And this is the single biggest difference from what we did in the last series. In the last series, we wanted you working just before threshold, remember? Yeah. So that when you work before threshold, it shifts it to the right. I want you to go past threshold and work at max. So if we're talking about gears, what gear do you think you're going to be in? Five. Yes. <laughs> if you're in five, how long do you have before you run out of gas? One to five minutes. Exactly. Exactly. So the gears immediately become applicable now. Now, the other thing is when you work at max, your recovery time is exponentially longer then you work in gears two and three. So a good rule of thumb is no more than 10 to 20% of the training volume needs to be at, at max gear. So for you, that's probably two sessions a week. Two sessions a week, I want you in gear five, doing repeated bouts, so we're talking intervals, right? Of max running, max swimming, max biking, whatever it is. Ideally, I want you between 30 to 60 seconds of max work with a recovery 50 to 60%, so we're talking gear one. And you repeat that four to six times. That's a max intensity approach to increasing VO2. But then, okay, that's two sessions a week, but you're training 10, 12 sessions a week, including bricks, transitions, uh, everything, right? Yeah. Okay, if I'm doing that kind of intensity training, recovery is the next thing on my mind. So I want you to recover every third to fourth training session. Let's not put a day on it. Let's not put a time on it. Let's put a session capacity on it. Every three to four sessions, I want a recovery session, especially if you've had a max video two session in that window. All right? And we know that recovery sessions are 55 to 65%. We're going to talk in a little bit about what they can look like. The rest of your training, based on what I said, Utilization theory, where do you think I'm going to put you? What gears? Two, three. Exactly. Two to three. And I don't care if you're doing tempo runs, which is steady state within that gear. I don't care if you're undulating within those gears, but you're going to do two to three. And then I want one session a week, one session a week to maintain the threshold you've worked real hard to achieve. Because if we just improve the size of your engine and we don't work on threshold, there's a chance it could actually slip back to the left. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Two sessions a week, VO2 max on intensity. One session a week on threshold, which means train just below it and shift it to the right. The rest is going to be gears two and three, working on increasing your O2 capacity. And every third to fourth session, full recovery, full recovery session. Great. Got it.